a lot of us have probably blocked out much of the years of 2020 and 2021, right? Or if we haven't, we, we wish we might be able to. But as we think about those years, I want to ask, does the name ever given ring a bell for anybody? Ever given? Well, it's about to be. On March 23rd, 2021, I think we all remember the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal for a week. This was a 1,300-foot ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal and blocked the Suez Canal for six, for a whole week, for six days. And this single ship getting stuck there, it caused repercussions for trade all over the entire world. It caused about, impacted $10 billion worth of trade, one ship for six days in this critical place in the world. So as we remember that, here's something more recent. Does this name bring a bell for anybody ever forward? No? Okay, well, it, it might, sure. So this ship, Ever Forward, is actually a sister ship of the Ever Given. It's owned by the same shipping company, Evergreen Marine Corporation. This is an 1,100-foot sister ship. Now, just to give some perspective on the size of these cargo ships, we have a 1,300-foot ship, an 1,100-foot ship. Just to give some perspective, the Empire State Building is 1,250 feet tall. And then to the very tip, to the very tip of that spire, it's 1,454 feet. So these ships are about the size of a skyscraper laying on its side, just to give you some perspective to how big these are. But going back to the name Ever Forward, this was much more recent. So a year after the Ever Given got stuck in the Suez Canal, another their sister ship, the Ever Forward, got stuck in the Chesapeake Bay. Now, it didn't cause the backup uh, that the ship stuck in the Suez Canal did because, well, as uh, one article I read about it kind of put it, well, other ships could just go around, you know, because it's in the bay. But, uh, you can imagine it was still pretty significant to have this huge ship stuck there in the Chesapeake Bay, especially, you know, for trade for all the cargo that was actually on the ship that was stuck there. There were nearly 5,000 shipping containers worth of items that were on this ship. So they were finally able to work this ship in a combination of, of dredging uh, mud around the ship, as well as they methodically removed actual shipping containers from the ship itself in order to lighten the load of this massive ship. Uh, one article said that they were they were going to remove or that they removed 500 containers, so a tenth of the containers that were on there they had to remove. In combination with dredging and also in combination with tugboats, in order to finally get this ship out of the Chesapeake Bay. So the, the one ship was stuck in the Suez Canal for six days. This ship was stuck in the Suez Canal for an entire month, I mean, in the Chesapeake Bay for the entire month. And it was only two months ago that this happened. They only got this ship out of the Chesapeake Bay in April of this year. But in order to remove you know, this ship, in order to, to get this ship going again, they had to offload weight, right? That would keep it down, that would keep it stuck. It kind of reminds, it should remind us of some more dramatic stories of, of ships that were caught in storms, right? And they were trying to get rid of weight so that they could, they could make it. They could ride out this storm that they could make it to a port. They could make it to shore. In fact, if you'll remember in scripture, this actually happened to the apostle Paul. Paul was actually on his way to Rome where he would most likely write this letter to the church in Philippi. But this happened to Paul. 
Uh, I would encourage you at some point to read Acts chapter 27, uh, and then you can read about this story. But this is what Paul, uh, this is what uh, Luke recorded in Acts chapter 27. I'll just read a couple of verses. We were being pounded by the storm so violently that on the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard, and on the third day with their own hands, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. They had to get rid of all this weight just to be able to survive, just to be able to make it. So as we continue in our letter uh, of Philippians, as we continue in chapter 3, verses 1 through 11 today, Paul gives us the sense of the things in his life that, at least in comparison to the, the goal and the focus and knowledge and the faith and the, our relationship with Jesus Christ, Paul gives us a sense of the things in his life that he felt he could toss overboard, the things that may be keeping him down, the things that may be weighing him down, or the things that may be a distraction from that goal in Jesus Christ. And as we're about to read, though they may seem like important things, and on their own, I'm sure they are important things, whether they're important or not is, is not the issue, but when compared with Jesus Christ, that's the point. It's as if he's comparing absolute junk to the most beautiful goal. So let's read from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. So this is what Paul says as he continues his letter. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not troublesome to me, and for you it is a safeguard. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of those who mutilate the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh even though I, too, have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. As Paul shares these words to the church there in Philippi, so far away, Paul talks about how there are others in the church. He calls them dogs. He calls them evil workers. He calls them people who mutilate the flesh. You can tell that Paul isn't very happy with these other workers in the church who who are seeking to lead Christians, especially Gentile Christians, astray in what is required of them in order to be part of the family of God. These people that he's referring to are specifically the Judaizers. They are people who are insistent that in order for these Gentiles to truly become part of God's family, to truly become Christians, they have to become circumcised in order to become part of God's family. That was specifically a Jewish ritual and custom. 
Paul addresses this in his letter to the Romans. He says that this actually is not the case, that they've completely missed the point of what circumcision is about. The circumcision is about the mark upon our heart rather than the mark upon our body. Whether someone has that outward sign that the Jewish people required is meaningless. If that mark of God is not at work in our heart. This is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is true circumcision something external and physical. Rather, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. As we go back to Philippians, Paul goes even further in his own life. He talks about circumcision, yes, that, that Jewish mark of God, but he goes on to even list even more things in his life, big accomplishments that do mean something in his life. They're not little things. They meant something to his Jewish world. And he lists these out in verses 5 and 6. He talks about circumcised on the eighth day. Then he says he was a member of the people of Israel. He's a member of the tribe of Benjamin. He is a Hebrew, born of Hebrews. He is a Pharisee. If you're going to talk about even zeal and try to put that on him, Paul says, I got zeal too. I was so zealous that I was persecuting the church. You can't get much more zealous than that. And he talks about his righteousness that you want to try to compare this to. I got it. I was blameless under the law. Paul sought forgiveness and atonement for everything that he had done. It doesn't mean he was sinless, but those sins that he did, he atoned for under the Jewish law. Paul says, these are my accomplishments. These are my credentials. Not only just circumcision, but all these other things. But then Paul says, none of that actually matters. Yes, they may be important things, but in comparison to Jesus Christ and knowing Jesus and having faith in Jesus, they don't actually make a difference. It's only in Jesus Christ where true life is found. And these things are nothing at all. In verse 8, he calls them a loss. He calls them rubbish. I'm not sure what your translation says for that word. Uh, the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, says rubbish in verse 8. But According to a number of commentators and translators, rubbish is kind of a, a polite word there. I mean, it, 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 it should be something a lot stronger than rubbish, which he compares these things as accomplishments and likes to. I mean, like absolute dumb, filth, garbage. There's a word I'm not going to say, uh, but it would even translate to even stronger language that in my military congregation would have no qualms about using. You can probably imagine what that word is that begins with an S. But that, that's basically what Paul is saying here. All these things in his life that, that he holds, that he may have held so dear at one point, there were accomplishments. And yes, again, they may be important things, but in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ, they still rank all the way down here. All those accomplishments of his, like the weight that could have, that was offloaded off that ship stuck in the Chesapeake Bay, like the cargo on his ship when he was in a storm, all those things, they can just be tossed overboard. They can be offloaded because in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ, in comparison when we're on the journey to knowing Jesus, that can just become weight that can cause us to get stuck. That can even become weight that can cause the ship to go down if they're not kept in their proper perspective. Then Paul tells us what matters. What matters in life is knowing Jesus Christ. That is where true life is found. And he, he talks about these things in verses 9 through 11. It's about gaining Christ. These other things are a loss. They're rubbish compared to knowing Jesus Christ, compared to being
being found in Jesus Christ alone. Whatever righteousness we think that we can build on our own, with, apart from God, that's nothing. But only righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ and it comes through faith in God and life in Him alone, that is what matters. Through knowing Christ, through knowing the power of His resurrection and living in that resurrection and reflecting that new life in our sinful world, even sharing in the suffering for Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? Even all those great worldly accomplishments are nothing when it comes to even suffering for Jesus Christ. Those are challenging words for our modern lives. Or remind us again that comfort, seeking comfort, can become just as much of an idol as anything else in our life. What matters is seeking after Jesus. What matters is even following him to the point of death and the hope of the resurrection that we have in Jesus. That's what matters. That's what matters. As we read these words from Paul this morning, we have to ask ourselves. We have to challenge ourselves. We have to let the Holy Spirit search us. We have to ask what are the things in our own lives that perhaps have become sources of pride that can keep us from true life in Jesus Christ. And when we discern those things, we have to be willing to bring each of those before our King, before our Messiah, Jesus. And we have to ask His guidance in what to do with each of those. This morning, we're going to celebrate the baptism of two of our neighbors and two of our friends here in the Amherst community. Last week, I had the chance to meet Lee Peng, and on Wednesday, I had the chance to meet his wife, Erica, or you. In a very real way, baptism is an act that shows the casting off of that extra baggage, that extra rubbish, those extra cargo units that keep us weighed down, that keep us from true life in God. As the water of baptism washes over us, this water shows the very work of God himself in putting to death our old selves and cleansing us in forgiveness and bringing us new life and making us a new creation in him alone. This is what Paul said in Romans. He said in chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. This is what baptism is. It's not some kind of magic ceremony or magic ritual where we try to manipulate God, but it is a sacrament, and it is, a, it is an outward sign of the inward act of God moving in our hearts, working in our lives, doing that circumcision of the heart that Paul talked about that brings us into that cleansing forgiveness and that new life that is restored and healed and everlasting in Jesus Christ as a new creation. When each one of us we're baptized. This is the work that God had done in us and that God is continuing to do in us. So it's very exciting today that we have really the privilege to see God at work in our new friends and our brother and sister in Jesus Christ, we pay in Erica. So this time I want to invite uh, them, and I'll let you decide who wants to share first, uh, to just share some of their story and why they would like to be baptized. 